What can we do in the face of a meteorite hitting the Earth? Such an event could cause many deaths and much destruction. Stay with me, Elon Kelman, for this next episode in our series when I'll be looking at threats from outer space. The impact by a large object from space, such as a comet or asteroid, could endanger many lives on Earth, and it might seem to be something that we can do nothing about. Even if the object doesn't hit the ground, skipping through or burning up in the atmosphere, it would produce a huge explosion in the air, raking the planet's surface with heat and pressure waves. On the morning of 30th of June, 1908, a region of Siberia was hit by a massive explosion, far greater than any known human power could have produced at the time. No impact crater could be found, because the object had seemingly detonated and disintegrated high in the atmosphere, delivering colossal heat and pressure to the surface. In another Russian region, the morning of 15th of February 2013, was brightened by a meteor streaking through the air and burning up, it was videoed by dash cams, phones, and security cameras. Within seconds, the shockwave broke thousands of panes of glass, injuring over 1,200 people, and it set off car alarms. A space object that reaches the Earth's surface is called a meteorite. Remnants of craters over 100 kilometers across dot the planet from the past billion years and some have been implicated as possible causes of mass extinctions. If a strike hit land today, gargantuan quantities of soil, rock and dust would be tossed into the air, enveloping the planet and cutting off sunlight. World temperatures could plummet for years, wrecking agriculture and ecosystems. A meteorite hitting water would vaporize the liquid below it and generate tsunamis, laying waste to coastlines and flattening cities far inland. A near-shore impact would leave victims just enough time to be numbed by the pressure wave and perhaps to register the water towering over them. Rather than counting up such massive losses, surviving the aftermath and reconstructing countries, warding off a strike is cheaper and easier. The object's path could be deflected to ensure that it misses the Earth. Deflection plans might demand tremendous monetary and energy costs, but they would be far cheaper than the monstrous expense and fatalities of an impact. We can then deal with space objects if we choose to do so. Any disasters resulting from them would be a consequence of our inaction, not a failure to eliminate vulnerability but a failure to deal with the hazard. Another hazard we know about and can plan for comes from the sun's activity and is called space weather. The sun's atmosphere spews out a steady stream of charged particles, which is called the solar wind and which, when intense, can produce a geomagnetic or solar storm disrupting electronics, frying power supplies, and stymieing communications. In October-November 2003, a series of solar storms led to the loss of one satellite and the shutdown of others, as well as interruptions of electricity grids and communication systems. Some polar airline flights were rerouted and warnings were issued to airline passengers and crews regarding radiation dosages. These responses demonstrate how we can reduce our vulnerabilities to space weather, for which we might have hours or days of warning. Preparations must be completed long before a warning is issued by adding shielding to electronics and being ready to shut down and restart equipment and systems. Providing full protection for all our earthbound, atmospheric and space equipment would not be easy because of the cost and time involved. It could be done. It is simply our choice whether or not to do so. Our activities cause climate change, but does climate change cause disasters? Join me next time to find out in the next episode of our series, The Signs of Disasters. Subscribe to the full series now, and don't forget to hit the bell button to hear about new episodes as they become available.